Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, as we continue worshiping, praising, and lifting high the Ancient of Days. I'm glad Joseph took to heart the singing lesson pointers I gave to him for that song, because I think it definitely made an impact there. You're welcome. Yeah. Charles Eugster. Anyone heard that name, Charles Eugster? Charles Eugster is the greatest British sprinter that you probably have never heard of. At the age of 96, Charles won the European Sprinting Championship in the over 90s division, barely missing the world record only because he pulled his hamstring halfway through the race. He holds five different British records for sprinting in his 90s, among other bodybuilding and fitness awards. Eugster also indulged in public speaking, writing, rowing, wakeboarding, entrepreneurship, and fashion design in which he was planning his own line in elderly couture. An impressive resume, certainly. He once heralded himself as the healthiest man on the planet, and he claims to have reversed the aging process. Charles died in April of 2017. The Titanic set sail in 1912 as one of the largest and most luxurious ships of its time. The ship carried 2,224 passengers and crew, some of which were the most affluent individuals of the modern world. If you remember the movie, there was a line that reflected the thought about the greatness of this ship. Even God himself could not sink this ship. It sank on April 15th, 1912, killing more than 1,500 passengers and crew. What about Blockbuster Video? Do you remember Blockbuster Video? Elizabeth and I often tell our kids, we've told them several times about Blockbuster Video and how it was one of our dating uh, destinations. Before we were married, we would go to Blockbuster Video and rent Rent, go in and pick it out and take it with you and leave and rent a movie. The kids can't wrap their minds around a store filled with movies that you rent opposed to doing it right on your TV. In 2004, at its peak, Blockbuster Video consisted of 9,094 stores worldwide, employing 84,300 people was the most successful video distribution service of its time, grossing over a billion dollars in revenue and assets. In 2014, Blockbuster folded, shutting down its last 300 remaining stores, except for one. You may not know this. One Blockbuster video remains, independently owned in Bend, Oregon, taking its once 84,300 employees down to three in 2019. In 2020, COVID-19 swept across the world. As it pertains to our own country, we saw and are seeing major changes across our country's landscape. At the beginning of 2020, what was once a historically booming economy came tumbling down after COVID began to ravage our country. Further in our country, we pride ourselves in our outstanding medical care, and rightfully so. Yet with COVID, the medical field has been scrounging to try to find a cure, a vaccine, or some other measure in order to prevent the spread, cure the virus, treat people effectively, and create a preventative. With the differing medical opinions out there on what works and what does not work, where people once had great faith and trust in the medical community for for some, for many, that trust has been tarnished. One of the greatest, if not one of the strongest, if not the strongest countries in civilization has been thrown into disarray with the COVID-19 virus. Now, what are these four things have in common. 
What does Charles Eugster, the Titanic blockbuster in the United States have in common? They all have a start date and an end date. They all have a time when they were thriving, when they felt indestructible, and then they have a time when they were or will be ravaged, shaken, and destroyed. Using biblical language, they are like grass here today and gone tomorrow. All of these stories demonstrate the same thing, and that is that the things of this world that seem so valuable, the things of this world that seem indestructible, the things that this world treasures will fall. They will fail you. They will cease, and they will lose their value. None of these things, nor anything else temporal, are worth building your life upon. And so while all of these things are not worth building your life upon, there is something that will not meet the same fate. There is something that will not meet the same fate as everything else we've mentioned and everything else we see around us. And that's the Word of God. The Word of the living God. And as we will see from this passage, verses 6 through 8 of Isaiah 40, the only thing worth living for and the only thing worth building your life upon and my life upon this morning and every day of our lives is the unwavering and eternal Word of God. The only thing. And so, church, we need to hear this today. We need to hear this every day. We need to write this on the forefront of our minds lest we be completely rattled and taken back when the next pandemic hits. When we fall ill, when we lose a loved one, when we get cancer, when we lose our business, when the country or the medical field fails us, and when any other effect of a sin-stricken world closes in around us because the Word of God endures forever. So if you would, would you stand as we read Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. The Word of God reads, A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Pray with me. Father, as we look to your word that will stand forever, God, let us refrain from placing our hope our trust on anything else other than this word. Your word is sufficient. Your word is powerful. Your word is living and active. It tells us about your greatness, about how you have worked through history tells us what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Your word is sure. Your promises are true. And God, let us build our house upon this rock. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to give you some insight into why I think this is a timely and important message for us as we close out 2020. All of us have walked through various hurdles this year. All of us have walked through a variety of troubles, many of which are related to COVID-19, but others that may not have been related to COVID-19. And it seems like this year has been one challenge after another in our personal lives, in our business lives, in our church life, in our school life, and on and on it goes. You fill in the blank. 
With this, many have been very adamant that they're ready for 2020 to end. I have said this very same thing. Will this year ever end? But as I've thought through this, the reality is that my desire for this year to end is wishful thinking. Your desire for this year to end is wishful thinking. It is wishful thinking because we think that once 2020 is over, then all of our problems, or at least the major problems, will disappear. Surely when this year is over that has been one hurdle after another, surely 2021 is going to be a lot different. And everything's going to go back. And the problems will cease. But church, we need not be so naive as to think that this is the case. You see, while 2020 has certainly been filled with a variety of difficulties, we need not think that 2021 is going to be any different. Because if you think about it, and if I had to guess, 2019, 2018, 2017, and on and on it goes, had their fair share of troubles as well. The reason this is true is because this world has been stricken by sin. Because we live in a fallen world, for the believer, there is no escape from suffering until we take our final breath. So we need not have this mindset that the grass is greener on the other side of 2020, lest we crumble when we find out that it's not. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, this guy's really depressing me today. We just came off Christmas. I'm feeling good and jolly. And he's making me sad. All this gloom and doom that is ahead. Well, I hope this is not the case, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm not trying to be pessimistic at all. I actually have really good news for us on the last Sunday of 2020. And here is why. What is true in the year 2020 is still going to be true in the year of 2021. This is good news. Now, while 2020 felt like someone was constantly punching us in the face over and over again, the same grace that sustained us in years prior is the same grace that will sustain us for years in the future. And in 2020, nothing changed about God. In 2020, God remained sovereign. God remained good. God remained faithful. And every promise that God has ever made to his people continued to stand in 2020. So what I'm saying is that the same God who sustained us by his word in 2020 will be the same God who will sustain us in the years ahead, even as they offer their fair share of troubles. And we can rejoice in 2020, Christian, because God is still on his throne and he continues to do everything he pleases because he is God. And while everything around us seemed to be falling apart and the world seemed to be caving in, the word of God remained the same because the word of God endures forever. This is what we want to herald this morning. Do not look for better days ahead and miss the truth of the gospel that is and has been right in front of you. Isaiah 40 shed some light on this truth. In Isaiah 40, the prophet Isaiah is coming to grips with the reality that the remaining remnant of Israel will find their place in captivity in Babylon. The Assyrians had been defeated, and now Isaiah looks ahead to see Babylon destroying Jerusalem and the Jews going into captivity, which happened in 586 B.C. But he also saw God forgiving his people and delivering them from captivity, returning them to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Isaiah confronts the people of Israel by preaching the recovery of Israel from their sin by faith and encouraging them to be patient as the Lord delivers them from the bondage of Babylon, which was a consequence of their own sin. And so he does this in four voices in chapter 40, in this first part. First, the voice of pardon in 1 and 2. The nation sinned greatly against God, but God continued to remain, they continued to remain his people. He chastened them out of love. He disciplined them as a father does. Second, the voice of providence in verses 3 through 5. 
The Jews had a long road ahead in rebuilding Jerusalem, but the Lord would go before them and he would open the way for them. Third, the voice of promise. This is what we're considering today in verses 6 through 8. Assyria and Babylon were gone, and Israel's reliance was now upon the unchanging word of God. Fourth, the voice of peace in verses 9 through 11. The nation climbs out of the valley and declares the victory of God over their enemy. And so with this being said, after a very long introduction, I want to spend a few moments considering the unwavering truth of God's Word and how His Word is the only thing worth building our lives upon. And so my first observation this morning, the things that wither, the things that wither. Look at verses 6 and 7. It says, A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Now the voice of God is speaking to Isaiah and calling him to cry out. And Isaiah is going, well, what shall I cry? He's to cry authoritatively. He's to cry truthfully. He's to cry boldly and clearly to the people of God. And this is a message that needs to be heard and a message that needs to be received. And so he says that everything is like grass that withers. Very similar statement that we find in Ecclesiastes with King Solomon. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everything under the sun is vanity, here today and gone tomorrow. And so in this cry, Isaiah recognizes the sovereignty of God in possessing all of life and possessing all of death. He recognizes that man is but a flicker in the grand scheme of eternity one of which God controls. In the context of this passage, as Isaiah cries aloud to the people, Assyria is gone. Babylon will be gone. Like the grass, the nations and their leaders would fulfill their purpose and fade away. Be gone like grass. You see, this is an all-encompassing reference to the reality of what we deal with and see every day. This is the ever-present reality that has been working itself out throughout history since the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. There is nothing that we see or do that will last forever. Everything is weak. Everything is mortal. Everything around us and everything about us is passing away. Our bodies, our minds, our qualities, our attributes, they are all like grass fading away. Too often, we act like here in the physical present sense that we're immortal. We are immortal in the sense that our souls, we will live forever, and as believers, our bodies will be raised, and soul and body will be united and live with Christ in the new heaven and new earth. But often we act like there is no death that awaits us, that everything we do here is eternal and everlasting. We look at history and we think about the reign of nations. We think about kings and rulers and think that they dominated for this considerable amount of time when it's barely a drop in the bucket of eternity. The reality is that all of the hopes of man are like grass. Quite frankly, more than likely, you and I will be forgotten in a hundred years, if not sooner. How many of us really know our family history? How many of us know the names of our great-great-grandparents and beyond? Now, some do, and I think that's great. I think it's awesome, actually, have a rich family history. But if I had to guess, very few of us do. But my point is, everything is fading and nothing lasts forever. Even the most highly valued things among men are all vanity. Now, don't get me wrong, man does have some shining qualities, which is why Isaiah here, we see that he is is equating man like a flower. We like flowers. They're pretty. A flower is a thing of beauty, but a flower can be gone in one swoop of the wind, can it not? 
This is not an indictment that there can't be any beauty or nobility found among men here on earth. It's just the reality that things will not last. Think about this year, 2020. What are some of the things that you've held value to this year? I think we've learned a lot about ourselves. If we're honest, we've probably learned a lot about ourselves. We've learned about what we hold on to tightly. We've learned about how we cope in the midst of distress, in the midst of trouble, some in healthy ways, others unhealthy ways. But what are some things we've put our faith in in 2020? Maybe we've put our faith in our health. My health will sustain me. Our jobs, our finances. Maybe we've put our faith in social distance, faith in masks, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, a stimulus check, or no stimulus check, a vaccine, our family, life itself, the school system, and on and on it goes. You see, we put a lot of stock in these things, but in the end, friend, they're like grass. They are the things that will wither. And if your faith is in any of these things, there is no doubt that this year has crushed you. There is no doubt that this year has crushed you, and there is no doubt that next year will crush you, and the year after that, and the year after that, and the year after that. If your faith, your trust, and your hope is in anything in this world, the reality is that they will fade away and be no more. They will not sustain you, and they will not stand. Charles Eugster's health couldn't stand. He died. The Titanic couldn't stand. Now it sits at the bottom of the ocean. The success of Blockbuster couldn't stand. The United States economy and healthcare system couldn't stand because nothing will stand. But what will stand? Surely, surely, church, all of these things will not stand. Surely, there is something that will stand. Surely, there is something that we can put our hope in that has always stood and will continue to stand. Surely, there's something. What has stood in 2020 and what will stand in every year forevermore? Forevermore. Second observation. The word of our God stands forever. Okay, verse 8, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. While everything else is like grass that fades away, there is one thing that you can take to the bank. You can cash this check. This thing will not fail you. There is one thing you can build your life upon that will never fade away and always proves true and trustworthy. It's the very thing that Bubba read about in Matthew 7. There is one thing, the Word of God. Charles Spurgeon recognizes five aspects of the Word of God that will stand forever that I'd like to share this morning. First, the Word of God's purpose will stand forever. The Word of God's purpose will stand forever. From eternity past, don't miss this, from eternity past, God has been executing his perfect plan by which he will make known his attributes in the salvation of his people. From eternity past, the perfect plan of God has been carried out through history, never once changed, never once stopped from eternity past. His plan will never vary. What God decrees will come to pass, and nothing can stand against God's plan and His purpose. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the purpose of God stands forever. COVID-19 did not change God's plans. The loss of jobs didn't change God's plan. Death didn't change God's plan. The eternal plan of God to redeem a people for himself and to give his people the new heaven and new earth has always been the plan and nothing can stand against it. Nothing. The eternal plan of God, friend, is worth building your life upon. It will not fade. 
it will not fail. Second, the word of God's promise will stand forever. The word of God's promise will stand forever. Every word God has ever spoken to his people by way of promise is just as true today as it was when it was first uttered. Every word. The promise of Isaiah 40 that God's word will stand forever is just as true today as when Isaiah cried cried aloud. This promise may have been fulfilled over and over again, but it will continue to be fulfilled because it is continually true. No word of God will cease to be of effect. How much mercy does God show to us in that His promises will never fail? Mercy. God promises to keep us. He promises to sustain us. He promises to give us strength. He promises to keep us in the midst of suffering. He promises to shower grace upon us. And he promises to never leave us or forsake us. And God's promises do not and will not fail. Even when we do not believe his promises, they continue to stand and remain faithful even when we don't believe it. Everything around us can pass away, but not even the slightest promise of God will fail. You've lost a family member. Your health is failing. Your job is lost. Your home is gone. You're drawing near to death. The promise of God that he will not leave you or forsake you continues to stand. Always and forever. Third, the incarnate word of God stands forever. The word of God is not just the Bible, it's Jesus Christ. John 1. Jesus will stand forever. He has and he will. Jesus does not change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same today as he was when you were first born again. And Jesus' blood will never lose its power until the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. We just sang it. We have an unchanging friend and Lord in Jesus Christ who does not change, does not depart, and always comforts us in the time of need through his Spirit. The incarnate word, Jesus Christ, will stand forever. And listen, you can build your life on that. Jesus will not wither and Jesus will not leave you if you're truly his. Fourth. The word of the gospel will stand forever. The word of the gospel will stand forever. The word of the gospel is what we preach. It's the word by which people are saved, Romans 10 tells us. The word stands forever. And listen, the same gospel the apostles preached is the same gospel we preach. Spurgeon said this, don't miss this, very important. Recollect that everything that is new in preaching is not true. And everything that is true is not new. You will never add anything to Peter and Paul. Or anything else, anybody else who's preached the true gospel. It will remain the same and always stand. Now there are many who have attempted to disprove the gospel. There are many who have called into question its verifiability and everything else in between. But there is not a truth that has been proven wrong. Students, hear this. When you go to college or you go out into the big bad world, they will try to tell you that it's false. That it's been proven wrong. There is not a truth of the gospel that has been proven wrong. 
Even the smartest atheist or deist has done their best at disproving the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they are still left with a straw man that cannot stand against the truth of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ, friend, listen, is worth building your life upon because it will not fade and it won't wither. When we're dead, the song, in the grave, we'll continue to sing the gospel, proclaim the gospel for eternity. Fifth, the word of God stands in the Christian spiritual life. Remember, for those of us who've been truly born again, we have been given the incorruptible seed that is the Word of God, which lives forever. All other mortal seeds die, but the immortal seed of Jesus Christ and divine truth lives forever. The Holy Spirit regenerated our hearts at salvation to that which is incorruptible. Therefore, we will live with and abide in Christ forever. God has placed the word of God into our hearts, and it will never be removed. Men may die. The Christian will not. When natural life expires, true life begins in the presence of Jesus. Death does not affect us whom God has regenerated by his Holy Spirit. The word of God in us will stand forever and we can build our lives on that. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever, endure forever. What are you building your life on today? What did you build your life on in 2020? What will you build your life on in 2021 and forevermore? You see, there's no doubt that all of us have put too much value onto something this past year that has failed us, that has let us down. Maybe it was even ourselves. But when everything around you is stripped away, when everything around you fades like the flower and withers like the grass, there is only one thing that will keep you, the Word of God. It stands forever. And this is the only thing worth building your life upon. Stop trying to build your life on your health. Stop trying to build your life on your job, your family, your sports, your kids, your school your comfort, your convenience, or anything else in the world because these things do not last. I've never met a parent who wasn't upset later in life for not instilling the gospel into their kids more. What will we build our lives upon? Because all these things will fail you. And not only will they fail you, they will lead you to an eternity filled with God's righteous judgment against you because all of these things are worthless gods. Build your life upon the gospel. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ because he will not fail you. As a church, one of the ways we're seeking to build our lives upon the word of God is by reading the written word of God together. Starting on January 1st, which is this week, we'll be starting a church-wide Bible reading plan that I want everybody to be a part of. And our goal in 2021 is to read through the entire Bible as a church. It's obtainable. You may say, well, I can't do that. That's a whole lot of reading. Well, it might be more reading than you're used to, but the way the, 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 the way the plan we're utilizing has broken it up makes it more manageable. So you don't find yourself wading through four, five, six, seven, eight, ten chapters of Leviticus trying to figure out what's going on. And I ask you this, church. Will you commit to doing this? 
Will you commit to doing this for your own spiritual well-being? For the spiritual well-being of your family? For the spiritual well-being of your church, your church family? This is one way we can love and follow Jesus together as a church body. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. Now, don't put too much pressure on yourself. I know many of us have started things like this. We miss a day or two, and then it's like, well, we've missed a day or two, and we just scrap it, you know. No catching up now. Don't want this to be something you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself. We just want all of us to be in the Word together and growing spiritually as God works among us through His Word. Miss a day, move to the next. Will you commit to this with me, with us as pastors, with your church family? Will you commit to this with us? I hope you will. I really do. We can have conversations about what we're reading, discuss what we're reading, ask people, what was the Lord saying in this passage, you know? How did this speak to you this week? Questions, good questions. Now, you can pick up our reading plan at one of the Connections desk. We have them out front, printed copies out here and then back here. For those watching online, we've got them posted on our website under the, on the About Us tab, 2021 reading plan. Or you can contact the church office. We can email you one, mail you one, whatever works. But we want all of us as a church family to be reading together this year for the glory of God, the furtherance of his church. First Baptist Solo. Pray with me.